Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, you might notice some people laughing in the background of these episodes, and that is because this was filmed in front of a live virtual audience via Zoom. Uh, I do these shows three times a month, record them in front of a live virtual audience, uh, and you can be a part of this live virtual audience by getting tickets to one of these shows uh, where you can go get your tickets at krishmohanhaha.com. They're only $5 for one show, or you can get a multi-show pass and save uh, a few extra bucks. Uh, but if you become a sustaining member of this show, either on Patreon uh, or directly on my website or via PayPal or through Bandcamp, various different ways where you can become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to come to see the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows, which eventually become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, which is awesome. Uh, and not only that, uh, but these shows are filmed in the River's Edge studio, which is part of the River's Edge radio network. And I couldn't be thankful for uh, more thankful for being a part uh, of, of the studio. Uh, the River's Edge is your place to get local Pittsburgh music from the Pittsburgh area 24-7. Just go to the TuneIn app, download that app, and look for the River's Edge radio network. It's a 24-hour stream of independent music. The radio station is independently owned uh, and is located in Pittsburgh in the heart of Millvale. So you'll be supporting an independent local radio station. So check them out. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to the shows, if you want to become a patron, if you want to make a donation, uh, if you want to check out past episodes of the show, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. Thank you very much. And now onwards to the show. Hashtag capitalist lives matter. This is very right. <laughs> And this brings us to the third basic form of socialism, a worker-based socialism that we saw during the labor movement across the globe in the early 1900s. We have the economic system we have with its good points and its bad points, in large part because we don't allow democracy into the workplace. And these socialists right. say capitalism never did that. Capitalism is a hierarchical way of organizing an enterprise. A few people, the owner, the shareholders who have the big blocks of shares, they run capitalist enterprises. The mass of us have no control at all, and they run it for them. And the way to change society and make it better is to have the people who work in an enterprise, all of them, one person, one vote, have democratic control of the workplace as just as important as having democratic control of the community in which you live, the neighborhood in which you exist, and so on. This kind of socialism is micro-focused. It says, let's not talk only about the government and private enterprise. We don't mind private enterprise. The government doesn't have to control everything. There has to be some coordination. But the big issue for us, say these socialists, is the transformation of the workplace, the socialization of the workplace. So it becomes a community run democratically rather than something run by a small number of people who put their benefits, the so-called bottom line, as profits for them rather than a good life for everybody. Now, democratic socialists believe in democratizing our workplace, right? And in order, to, in order to truly democratize our politics and our society, we have to democratize, democratize our workplace. This form of socialism is about a way of life, a way of life that improves the human condition through social responsibility, co cooperation, and solidarity. One easy way to democratize workplaces is the model of worker co-ops, right? The idea that the workers own a piece of the company and are part of the decision-making team. And this is far different than owning stock in a corporation, right? Stocks still give the bosses more control, especially when one share of stock is worth like a week's pay. Like, what are you going to choose? Putting food on the table or buying one stock of a corporation? You know, plus, corporations practice in stock buybacks to make their company look better and retain more control. 
Look, stocks in Wall Street are pretty much a popularity contest for the, for the rich, and they're not a determination of the economy. And I know I've talked a lot about worker co-ops before, so this is sort of just a little bit of a short refresher, right? This would mean that workers get a say in the future of the company, right? There's a rotation of upper management that is based on a vote. People vote to put different people in charge of different things. And one of the things a lot of companies have said is that a manager can't be paid more than like eight times that of the lowest employees. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. decreases the income gap, ensures that everyone is treated with dignity and kindness, and it creates a community within the workplace rather than an environment of competition and backstabbing and just really uninspired water cooler talk, right? You know, just every day you just stand by the, it's just like, no, Randy, I don't give a shit who died in Game of Thrones, all right? You're, stop being a spoiler, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, by the way, Game of Thrones, most contemporary show I could think of for this reference. <laughs> 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 so... In the capitalist dystopia of America, though, CEOs and bosses are making upwards of 300 to 400 times that of an entry-level employee, right? Wages have remained stagnant and wealth continues to be funneled upward. At this point, we're looking at wage slavery in America. And if the richest country in the world has a vast amount of poverty, then I'm pretty sure that you're keeping the working class enslaved. And that's primarily what the system runs on, is slavery, right? In order to ensure that the mass wealth, the mass wealth of the few, it means that most of us have to suffer. But capitalists love to point out how socialism would lead to poverty and destitution and more slave-like conditions. And when you ask them to show proof of something like that, they just throw a smoke bomb and yell Karl Marx and run into the darkness. <laughs> In fact, Karl Marx, who some consider the father of modern socialism, was 100% anti-slavery, right? And he didn't say that because that was the on fleek things to say, thing to say, right? Kids are still saying on fleek. That's still a thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't true. know. I haven't been a kid a long time. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Karl Marx would use the word on fleek about things. <laughs> like capitalism, not fleek. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but no, he said that because it was the right and socially responsible thing to say. Right. Marx pointed out the need for slavery as, as an important paramount for capitalism. In order to make the value of the products worthwhile and turn a profit, it relies on slavery to make that happen. In capitalist America, slavery was so important that there were, we fought a civil war over it. And even that didn't end the practices of slavery, but it did evolve into a very special kind of bigotry, you know, one that involved like yeah. pretending you're a ghost all the time while calling yourself a dragon for some fucking reason. <laughs> A grand dragon. A grand dragon, which, what does it have to do with ghosts? Nobody knows. That's the secret. <laughs> right? You hoist a flag of the loser all the time. And I think this is the biggest cardinal sin, uh, sin of uh, capitalism, is an excessive amount of truck nuts. Too many truck nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, there's too many out there. One is too many. One is, yeah. yeah. Well, t I feel like a two would be too many, but uh, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> one would be hilarious if it's just one. A single truck. Nut. A single <laughs> testicle on a truck would be hilarious to me. But we're deviating. We're, we're, we're. But look, capitalism is fine with this kind of bigotry, right? As long as they can exploit that fear and bolster hatred to turn a profit. I mean, really think about it. In order for a successful crane rally, you need a hefty amount of lumber, right? Lighter fluid a lighter and a good one, not a cheap big one. You're going to go for the classy shit and at least like two dozen sheets. You can find all of that shit at Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> and at the end of it, you probably earn yourself enough points to get like at least a 15% off coupon. <laughs> not bad for a racist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
Now, Republican President Abraham Lincoln said the following in his first State of the Union address. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is the only fruit of labor and could not have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is, the, is superior of capital and deserves the much higher consideration. To translate Abraham Lincoln, fuck your bottom line. <laughs> I think I think Abe might have said it a little bit more eloquently than that, but you know that's just <laughs> kind of like paraphrasing. But Lincoln at this point was reading Marx. In fact, after the Civil War ended, Marx wrote to Lincoln, you know, congratulating him on uh, on, on the victory on this uh, and on a second term. And the UK ambassador to Lincoln wrote back to uh, Marx saying that Abe considered Marx a friend. So if the GOP are really going to consider hmm. themselves the How party of that? Lincoln, right, they better start taking up some socialist platforms like you know, empowering the working class, oh. decentralizing the banking industry, providing citizens with universal health care. Just little tiny socialist moves to be the party of Lincoln. Hmm. But the Republican Party today is not the party of Lincoln, right? It's the party of private industry and white supremacy. It's the party of racism. They're basically the right wing of the American war economy and shouldn't really take claim to be the party of a pro-labor leader like Lincoln. I mean, realistically, the Republican Party is, is basically the Whig Party now. That's a niche joke for people that know his, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I would say, I don't know who's going to actually get this joke, but I like it. I think it's funny. I think it's funny. <laughs> the Whigs were before the Republicans, a lot of the Republicans came from the Whigs. That's where Lincoln, never mind. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, at the end of the Civil War, America had an opportunity to divest from private industry and push a new pro worker political philosophy. Right, as social democracy in America would have been perfect for 1872. Now, Marx and Lincoln differed in various different ways, right? Primarily the use of money to value labor. Lincoln was all about paying the working class what they were worth, and Marx saw this as a new form of slavery. And look, based on the way things are going now, it kind of looks like Marx was, was, was right about this, right? This is projected today, not just in how little the American working class is paid, but also in the fact that we partner with countries that rely on slave labor, right? Nike, for example, uses slave labor while trying to uplift a community <coughs> that has a torrid history with slavery. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's like they almost like didn't really care about slavery and were just kind of Saying some shit Almost to like sell that. some fucking shoes. You know what? But who would be so rude? <laughs> <laughs> no one I know. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But not just that, but look at what happened to mining towns throughout the 1900s, right? These towns were owned and operated by coal companies who paid their employees in scripts or fake money that could only be used in that town. That was basically a form of slavery using fake money as a point of control. But it's okay, the coal companies had an answer for that, right? They basically said that they were giving the miners access to money, is what they were, they were giving them. <laughs> nice, that's what you, you want access to things. You don't just want right. the things, you know? <laughs> but the issue in a capitalist economy is, is that it's a way of life, right? The bosses control the working class's worth. That's what they do. They don't use money as a tool, but they use it as a point of control and exploitation, right? Capitalism is basically like every shitty X that you've ever had just combined into one economic force, but with a 6.8% interest. So <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> now the capitalist form of labor affects mental health of a lot of workers too. Right? Workers don't feel connected to the things they create because the bosses get all of the credit and a majority of the products, uh, or, or rather the profits. Right? 
Think about it. Who really gets the credit for the iPod, the iPhone, or any Apple product? Is it the developers? Is it the machinists? No, it's Steve Jobs, a man in a turtleneck that has probably never picked up a hammer in his life. <laughs> Even I've put together a chair in my lifetime, you guys. <laughs> Proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's a big moment. It's a big moment for me. In the capitalist labor market, the worker is alienated not only from the fruits of their labor and their creation, but also their fellow workers, right? Cubicles. Cubicles create an isolated environment. It's just you, your Excel spreadsheet, and your cat poster. That's it. <laughs> and you know what poster I'm talking about. You know, you know the hey, one where the cat, Friday. yeah, the cat's hanging onto the branches, you know, and it's, and it's mm -hmm. kind of struggling, but, and it says hang in there, but really, mm -hmm. but you know what that cat's really saying, right? You can look at it, you look the cat right in the eyes and you're like, I know what you're saying. You're saying my parents love my brother more. I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what that's saying. <laughs> now, I will say the one positive of the isolated cubicle culture is that, you know, you can probably drink to your loneliness and like masturbate in peace. There you go. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> A nice quiet place with your loneliness. A mental health professional, Dr. Harriet Fraud says, capitalism has created an adversarial relationship between employees and employers, as well as employees and other employees. There is a whole alienation of people from one to another. Plus, the way employment works is no one will hire you to do a job if you can't make more for your employer than you're getting as a salary. So you're always being robbed. He's always getting more. He's always trying to get more for him or herself than they give to you, which doesn't breed trust and kindness. No, it, amongst it, people. Right. It's an old argument of the critics of capitalism who use often the word alienation that being, if your job is always a situation where the employer, the boss, is trying to get more out of you and pay you less in one way or another, you're setting up in a tremendous adversarial situation in which you you're on guard you're you're distrustful you're bitter you you're unhappy look human beings are social creatures right we need each other our evolution and the creation of tools occurred through cooperation not hyper competitive bootstraps mentality but this is one of the major arguments that capitalists have made, right? If left to our own devices, we would choose to run a capitalist society. It's the natural way of handling things like, you know, using exploitation and fear mongering and commodifying everything and everyone all the time. That's just how nature operates, you guys. So, you know, if you're looking for like a green kind of natural organic economic system. There you go. It's probably capitalism. You know, you know what the strange part is? Uh, wolves haven't invented capitalism. Right? <laughs> They're rather cooperative in their societies. Their behavior is very much uh, capital, uh, uh, cooperative, you know? It's almost like the wolves are like Darwinian socialists. It's like a new form of socialism that I just invented. <laughs> right? Chimps, chimps are very close to human beings. They haven't invented capitalism. Although there is an experiment where, where chimps were in, uh, introduced to money, they got money uh, and immediately started prostituting themselves for bananas. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of feel like the only part of human life that's like natural to capitalism is using sex to, you know, get bananas. <laughs> Which I feel like is, um, is going to make grocery stores real fucking weird. <laughs> but the socialist principles of worker co-ops are more natural to human behavior than the competitive slavery brace grind of capitalism, right? The socialists of the labor movement said eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours to do what we please. The right. labor movement fought for the eight-hour workday and less slave-like conditions. 
but capitalism doesn't believe in that, right? We're at a point where most Americans can't even afford a $400 emergency. That is the cost of four tires on your car, at least for, for my car, it's, that's, that's about what it, what it costs, right? And this is on top of excessive debt that keeps mounting to, to keep things like a car or a house. So in order to stay afloat, most of these workers have to work two or three jobs. So there goes the eight hours to sleep or do what we please. Capitalists want a 24 hour work schedule where they make money hand over fist on a constant basis over the exhausted bodies of the American working class. And we have to take on all these jobs to, to work as much as we do because poverty is looked at as a crime. It's shameful to be poor. And leisure is looked down upon in a capitalist society too, right? It's said that Americans spend about $400 a month on vacations, entertainment, and other frivolous and unnecessary luxury items. Yeah, look, this is why we don't value art, right? Art speaks out against the status quo, opens your mind and helps you think critically. And it makes us all a little bit more creative. But if it's seen as superfluous, then it's easy to cut and keep an entire populace in dark without questioning things like why housing and healthcare are privatized and unaffordable. And this is why capitalists claim that, especially capitalists in America claim that if we switch to socialism, then my job as a comedian would be over because it's seen as so frivolous, you know? Socialists mm -hmm. have valued at mar and partnered with our uh, artists of all kinds. Artists are and always have been a part of the working class. You know who can take a joke? Eugene Debs, Karl Marx, <laughs> Friedrich Engel, I, I bet fucking all these people would love this show, right? Mother Jones. <laughs> I get a fucking standing ovation from that Octonagerian, probably, maybe. <laughs> if she had her cane, if she had her cane, she could fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know who can't take a joke? Anyone that makes over $400,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> They're literally the only people that see art as frivolous are capitalists, right? Because artists don't want to work for them. We want to work for ourselves right. and the betterment of mankind as a whole. Now, occasionally you do get artists that work for the system, right? Your Jeff Foxworthy's or the racist puppet master, Jeff Dunham, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or friend of war profiteers, Ellen De DeGeneres. <laughs> and so mm. there's, you know, some people that do. Also, how many yachts are necessary for one person to have, right? How many cartons of ice cream is it necessary for one family? How many private <laughs> jets are necessary? Look, the working class are, are, is chastised all the time, all the time for wanting a little bit of uh, uh, art and leisure, but the rich never are, right? The rich are living on uh, constant vacations over the hard work of the proletariat. <laughs> That this is this is kind of you know people don't really talk about it a whole lot because in capitalism the the bosses are fetishized right someone in the working class could eventually become the boss so more people are willing to give these big shots a, a free pass now one of the other arguments within capitalism is that well the bosses are the ones that put the capital forward, you know, to create the factory or the businesses and build these facilities that these workers are working in. So, so they should get more back in return because they took the risks and made the investments. And that's true. More. Yeah, but when we the people participate in the stocks and take risks there and it fails us, we're basically left to eat it, right? And look, if that is the case, right, they are the ones to put the capital forward, then shouldn't the bosses also be producing some of this labor too, right? Wouldn't that make a little bit more sense? I don't know about you, but I haven't seen Jeff Bezos in one of his football-sized warehouses taking only 38 seconds to pee. <laughs> That's the last time we saw that. Like, this is literally like, your parents asking you to pay off the hospital bill just because you were born. 
And my argument is that sometimes the kids do pay that off, you know, yeah. with like self-hatred and chronic anxiety. So mm. was that too sad? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 Just a, like one fading awe in the background. <laughs> that was Jessica. <laughs> oh, no. That's because it's too real. It's too real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> This is this is the part of the the show where I I, I reach into your soul and I, I display it for everybody. That's what. <laughs> but it's okay because the working class is also going through this chronic anxiety too. You know, look, you're allowed to take a vacation. You're allowed to have leisure time. That's the idea behind the eight hour workday, right? Most days. I work between nine to 13 hours to ensure that I can, you know, be kind of poor and not just destitute in the streets. Right. And I'm not, the, most Americans are in the same boat too. And here's the thing in other nations, that's not the case in other nations, minimum wage jobs, people that have minimum wage jobs can afford to take a vacation and they get paid sick leave. That a McDonald's employee in Norway gets more vacation time than just about any American worker, regardless of field or salary. Meanwhile, in the United States, we abuse our low-paid workers and lambast them for being lazy and not finding a better job. Yeah, not only yep. do Norwegian McDonald's employees get vacation time, uh, they also don't get any diarrhea after they eat McDonald's. <laughs> 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 Fucking, I don't know what they're doing in Norway, but I feel like we should <laughs> learn some shit. But this obsessive quality with work is the American dream, right? To, to, to one day work hard enough so you can be rich, you know, kind of, sort of, I, probably not really. <laughs> right? If a government and a society isn't going to be there for you at your worst, then why even have a government? Right? The pull yourself up by your bootstraps uh, argument advocates for anarchy far more than Antifa or yeah, actual anarchists. anarchists like Emma Goldman. Right. With socialism, not only would it mean uh, a more democratized workplace, but also a government and an economic system that would ensure things like housing, food, medicine, and basic human rights. The point of work wouldn't just be to make money, but it would give workers a sense of purpose to be a part of a growing and evolving community. Poverty would not be a shameful, or, or it wouldn't even be a crime, right? But a good reason for the community to come together and lift each other up, right? We would be far more responsible to each other than competing with each other and reveling in the misery of our neighbors. Schadenfreude, you guys have heard of this word, schadenfreude. Uh, it's yeah. the philosophy that humans gain pleasure from the misery of others. Yeah, Th and this is true only for really sad people that don't have a <laughs> sense of purpose or community in their lives, right? Mr. McConnell. <clears throat> <laughs> but schadenfreude is how ca capitalist labor markets work, right? You have to compete to outdo and kill your fellow employees for that extra 50 cents an hour. And maybe, maybe a new cubicle with a different mm. cat poster. <laughs> Pretty cool. A socialist labor market is basically the opposite of that. And here's the thing, socialism has always been a part of the agenda in American politics. In the early 1900s, I mentioned this before, the Socialist Party of America was growing and gaining notoriety. A hundred years ago, 1916 to be precise, was the first time that the Socialist Party of America put forward a candidate for president. His name was Alan Benson, it was his name. And he ran for president, 1916, a hundred years ago, and he got 600,000 votes in the United States. We were a much smaller country then, and that worked out to 3% of the vote. Okay, the Socialist Party thought that was a good beginning, so they ran again four years later in 1920, a little less than 100 years ago, and they had a different candidate, a man named Eugene Victor Debs, uh, head of the Railway Workers Union, very good orator, and he did better. He got 900,000 votes. That's a 50% increase in four years, 4% of the total vote. 
Four years later, another socialist ran, 1924. Only he changed the name, because by that time, the fear of socialism had led to an enormous effort by the government, most famously the Palmer Raids up in Boston, uh, hounding communists and socialists and arresting them and all of that, and people got a little scared. So what the third effort was, they changed the name. They didn't call it the Socialist Party, they called it the Progressive Party. And they ran a, a man from Wisconsin named Robert La Follette, famous socialist politician from America, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. He ran for president on the Progressive, yeah. but he was clearly a socialist like the others. Okay, um, he got five million votes. They went up five times. Wow. It worked out to 17% of the total vote that year for president. Now, I don't want to be that guy and do the whole actually, but actually, Dr. Richard Wolf, who I love, uh, did miss one little thing. In 1912, Eugene Victor Debs actually ran against uh, Woodrow Wilson under the Socialist Party of America and garnered uh, a million votes in 1912, which was 6% at that time. Um, so, uh, and then you had Teddy Roosevelt that was running against, uh, pretty much pushing back against the Republican Party with the Bull Moose Party, and he got 20% of the votes. Uh, so since 19, between 1912 and 1916, there was a drop, but it, and then it picked right back up. But here's the thing, this rise, this popularity in socialism in the early 1900s, the, the, the Democrats couldn't have any of that, right? So again, they used the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act to prosecute and attack them. But here's the thing, it's back, baby. Socialism is back on the agenda in American politics, especially in 2020. From a recent poll by NBC and the Wall Street Journal who worked together on these polls, and this poll showed that 25% of voting Americans believe that socialism is an attractive quality in a candidate when they think about who they're going to vote for. Well, that kind of blew my mind. After over half a century of endlessly demonizing anything and everything having to do with socialism, that one quarter of the American voting population feels they would be drawn to a candidate who said of himself or herself, I'm a socialist, tells you something about change in America beyond what a million other surveys might show. Now, right now, some of the most popular uh, socialist ideologies in the American zeitgeist are Medicare for all, universal basic income, universal education, and you know, just like the general idea of taking care of each other. During this pandemic, a capitalist economy running a so-called democracy created the worst depression this side of the century, an eviction epidemic, a troubled education system, and a climate that is on a fucking debt spiral. Americans are out of work, money, and energy. And Congress goes on vacation. Because, you know, fucking the working class that hard is very exhausting. Guys, it's a lot of hip movement. And you know, some of these people are old. You gotta, they don't have the hips that they used to, you know? If they were a 20-year-old capitalist, they'd be nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> But here's the thing. Thanks to folks in the Democratic Socialists of America or the DSA and a nationwide mutual aid revolution, these mutual aid organizations, people were able to feed their families, their neighbors, and overall just take care of each other. It's almost, it's almost, dare I say, like we're becoming a real Christian nation. You know? <laughs> because the reality is Americans are sick of being in medical debt, student debt credit card debt and owing our cousins $20 for buying us some condoms when we were 24 because we were finally <laughs> going to bang our high school crush. <laughs> Bullshit, Randy. You're doing me a real. favor, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's personal. That one's, you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> but 
And that has been your forkful of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you, you are, you're sharing this out with your friends, with your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy this show. Uh, and, and more importantly, make sure that you are subscribed, whether that you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're watching this on Facebook, listening to the audio version of this show, uh, or on rockfin.com, which is the uh, ad-free blockchain cryptocurrency site where the content creators are a part of the company. So uh, there's no censorship, there's no ads, and we're, we're all part of the family. And if you become a subscriber over at Rockfin for $10 a month, you get all of the exclusive premium content, not just for myself, but from all of the creators on Rockfin, people like Graham Elwood, Ron Placone, Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore, a uh, ton of people that are on Rockfin. So uh, make sure you are subscribed. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to these live virtual events that happen three times a month on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. You can also become a sustaining member to get free tickets and additional bonus unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content. Uh, you can um, also make a one-time donation. Check out all of my stand-up comedy albums. Uh, keep up to date on what, when my live shows are coming out uh, and sign up for my email list. Once again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next week.